<coughs> this is my title, <coughs> and those are my disclosures. So rheumatoid, I was asked to talk about the diagnosis and the management of rheumatoid, which is uh, something which has advanced hugely recently, uh, and it's fairly straightforward. Uh, if you're not interested in diagnosing rheumatoid er early, it's very easy. Uh, but if you are, at, and now we're interested in diagnosing before you've got arthritis, it becomes increasingly difficult. And I took a series of pictures of patients, uh, consecutive patients in our early arthritis clinic, and this was just one of them, and, uh, and I thought it would just illustrate the point. This is a patient who's fairly typical, 45 years old, uh, has had hand pain for eight weeks, 50% response to NSAIDs, which she continued to take. She had mild swelling in three hand joints, and she was one of the, the few these days that we see with synovitis that we can't easily classify, and she had normal x-rays. So if you were talking to the students, and we have sort of endless students in the clinic, you ask them, uh, has this patient got rheumatoid? And, you know, they have the three choices, and I'll... These choices, as you'll gather, are not for voting on, as you have no voting. But the, it, it makes you stop and think, has this patient really got rheumatoid? Because the implications are considerable. And it was to address questions like that that the ACR EULAR initiative was started. And essentially, it was to allow earlier identification of rheumatoid arthritis, and particularly to differentiate for other pathologies at a time when it wasn't completely obvious what these patients had. And controversially, uh, we took in this classification criteria the requirement for methotrexate as the ultimate gold standard. So if a patient required a methotrexate, that was equivalent to a diagnosis of rheumatoid. And as you, I now know well, because these have now been around for three or four years, uh, so it is designed for patients without erosions. Those who have erosions are considered to have rheumatoid already. So the first step is synovitis. Second is to exclude radiographic erosions. And then we have the combination of variables, which I think you now know. And this was done with a system uh, from a thousand minds with consensus and an initiative process. And what we came up with, as you see, is something that is heavily biased to the type of, of uh, morphology of the patient, focusing particularly on the small joints. And if you have greater than 10 joints with at least one small joint involvement, you have five points, and you only need six to be definitive uh, or definite RA. So if you have uh, far, lots of joints and one antibody, or you have duration greater than six weeks, so lots of joints and greater than six weeks, you're there and you get another one for an acute phase response. And you can do it prospectively or retrospectively. And this has changed, I think. It's one of the few times that our initiatives have changed management considerably because it does allow these patients to go into clinical trials. And the product of that you've seen, uh, I think, at this meeting with several early arthritis studies which have used this classification criteria. So let's go and look at this patient and you'll see that she actually turns out to have four points, which means she doesn't have definite rheumatoid. But there is a, a, a caveat, which you can use imaging if clinical synovitis is present. You can do it, so you can use it prospectively to, to score, retrospectively, even look backwards to see if some of these would have been fulfilled, and uh, particularly the joint count, if they've had joint injections, for example. Um, but you can use imaging, which is what we do routinely in all our patients when they present. They all get ultrasound, and most of them get MRI as well. So, what do we find when we look with our ultrasound? Well, unfortunately, we only get up to six joints, but we do have one erosion, and uh, there's also mild OA and crystal disease, not uncommon to have multiple pathologies. So, what do you do with a score of five? Well, it just shows that even these new criteria aren't perfect, and this is a real patient. Uh, the pro patient probably has RA, and we did treat with methotrexate, too, so to one extent, the, the criteria are incorrect. But the logic, we now actually have another logic. Uh, uh, an example I will give is that one recent study that we did of a biologic, there was more variation of the X-ray reading between the two readers than there was, and this is professional readers, 
than there was between the placebo and the active biologic, which was active. Uh, it was an anti-TNF. So uh, with that caveat, how many do you think that we would find? And I'll let you again mentally. This is what we actually found. If we look at the patients who were non-erosive on x-ray, 40% actually had erosions. They're the ones down here. And we also have this concept of a true erosion where there is active synovitis associated with the erosion because there are, in normals who've never had erosions, they will, there will be a small proportion who do have changes, both on x-ray, CT, and on ultrasound. How many of the x-ray erosions, therefore, were false? Well, of the 17%, we found that only 32 out of the 38 actually were true uh, erosions. And the true erosion on uh, grayscale or power Doppler goes down to 13%. So if you take the x-rays, they go down from 38, which is still a small figure, to just 13%. So our total number actually is 45%, which is almost completely the reverse. Well, when we look at the patients who actually have true synovitis and true ultrasound erosion, it's almost completely different to the x-ray data that we would have otherwise provided. So our, my message here is that if you are going to diagnose patients, by all means use the uh, ACR EULA criteria. They'll do very nicely for anyone who's got uh, long-standing long disease. They'll do pretty well with patients who've got three months of disease, but they're not as good as they could be uh, because they don't include some of the evidence we have. And if we look at what we can do, we turn subclinical synovitis into RA. Uh, UIA becomes RA. In the presence of true ultrasound, UIA becomes RA. I haven't, the stuff in lighter color, I haven't actually shown you the evidence for, but it identifies false positive erosions on x-ray, which again makes a difference. Sorry, so the, the conclusion, I think they're imaging frequently, and it's about, in our hands, quite consistently, just under 50% of newly presenting patients are reclassified or remanaged because of what we find on sensitive imaging. So what about the management of RA? Well, we had some new draft guidelines which have changed a little bit the way I will present this, but I will give a personalized view. I was a minority in some of the, the ULAR uh, guidelines. Um, I'll explain some specific guidelines and uh, give, give an alternative view of others. Well, the cornerstone of the ULAR guidelines are the three phases of, of uh, therapeutic approach. These are, of course, the revised guidelines after our first attempt that we aim at a target of remission or low disease activity by six months. We start with methotrexate plus glucocorticoid or a combination of uh, a conventional synthetic DMARDs plus glucocorticoid. Uh, the feeling was that biologics were not needed as first line. And then they were stratified by risk factors if initial strategy failed. So if we look at some of these, uh, I think it's possible to query uh, the, the validity of some of them, but I'll give you the logic and the studies behind those decisions. If we take the, the question of why methotrexate and glucocorticoids rather than biologics, and you will know that the draft uh, guidelines from the ACR on Monday uh, actually suggested that they will go with monotherapy now, without steroids actually, um, as first line. And then we have an early addition of biologic after methotrexate failure. And the logic for this, uh, this is the best study, <clears throat> and what it shows is that the combination with glucocorticoid appears to be as good as the combination of methotrexate and anti-TNF in actually uh, reducing the DAS44 on this occasion. <clears throat> the other reason is this. This is the Optima study. <clears throat> and in patients who are initially, about 44% of patients get a response defined here, which was an early DAS less than 3.2 at two time points. And if they fail, uh, on, and they had the patients down here who were actually failing on, on methotrexate alone, so we're comparing these two arms and what happens to these patients here compared to these patients here. And what you find is the catch up in this very early population in terms of clinical responses is complete. They actually get exactly the same outcome, so this delay of six months doesn't seem to make any difference. Now you'll be aware that the radiographic changes are quite different in this two population. <clears throat> 
The more controversial one that we, we produce, which is now the one that the ACR has agreed with, is no preference for combination DMARDs. Uh, and that was based on uh, some studies, and uh, although that there was evidence from older studies that uh, triple therapy may have worked, the more recent studies, and this is showing it here, T-REACH, which compared uh, monotherapy and triple therapy with various steroid combinations, showed, although you could, again can argue that, that uh, there was a trend, but there was no advantage of combination DMARD over methotrexate. And it's been long held by many that if you don't respond to a full dose of methotrexate, the additional benefit, uh, as opposed to actually subtherapeutic doses of methotrexate, is rather less. But you, I, I can accept there are different interpretations of those data. Why combine biologics with methotrexate? This is a big issue about whether monotherapy can, in, from certain drugs, be as good. And uh, the, the, in particular, the blockade of IL-6, and perhaps uh, more recently with the, the JAK inhibition, suggests that you perhaps don't need methotrexate as much as you do for some of the monoclonal antibodies. Well, this is a reinterpretation. Well, this is a, the, the function trial, which was shown at ULA and was shown again uh, yesterday. Uh, um, and in that study, you can see that even tocilizumab at, at high dose uh, significantly beats the equivalent without methotrexate and um, quite large margins. So even tocilizumab, uh, which has been the, the monotherapy mm -hmm. exemplar, does actually benefit from methotrexate, and it, that was also reinforced by the radiological data we saw yesterday. Why any biologics? Because our recommendation was after failure of the primary conventional DMARDs and, and plus or minus steroids, that any biologic could work. And these are data from different studies showing rituximab, tocilizumab, adalimumab, and abatacept that really you couldn't really have much more similar uh, responses. And you'll be aware of the AMPLE study which compared adalimumab and abatacept and showed virtually identical responses for all aspects of care. Why biologics rather than escalating to triple therapy? Well, this is the RACAT study, which uh, again has been interpreted in a different way, but for the purposes of ULAR, ACR70, which is effectively remission, does show a threefold increase in a high p-value, as well as for other aspects. I accept that you could look at different aspects of these studies and come to different interpretations. These were the interpretations made by the EULA, EULA, uh, for the EULA guidelines. So in summary, our recommendations were based on three systematic literature reviews, and I've mentioned all of these points. Use combination with biologic, and have remission, at, or at least low disease activity is your choice. And there were some differences. Uh, you could read them there, but they probably are being addressed. Although, I, I, one thing we might discuss at some point is why on earth steroids are now the last line of resource. We've always seen steroid as being effective early. But these guidelines aren't absolute. If we look at first line use of uh, TNF, for example, we showed some time ago that this was after a year of anti-TNF, that the patients who'd had that year of anti-TNF continued to do well with quality of life and function. The data that's been used in one way from Optima, if you look at this arm here, which was the patients who did well with the, the had remission induction or early disease, uh, uh, low disease activity, when we looked at them and compared stopping, and that was start watching them for 18 months after six months of therapy, there was very little change in their DAS, and importantly, there were no changes in their function. So these patients after remission induction did extraordinarily well. We do not know what those patients in that first example I did would happen if they stopped therapy. And you'll be well aware of uh, the stopping studies. This is the PRIZE study, which came out this week. And basically, uh, if you don't know the study, the patients went to, had a remission phase here, and then if 70% went into the next phase, which was half dose of etanocept, no etanocept, and no drug at all. And you can see that if you achieved remission, virtually everybody for the next year maintained it at half the dose. Now, that's not uh, suggesting you change disease, but it does change the health economics. And the same applies for hack. that if you actually achieve a normal hack, not only can you probably half the dose, but you can actually probably stop it. 
and the X-ray data were actually extraordinary for patients who actually had bad prognostic factors. There was no progression in any of these groups, suggesting that uh, a year of remission induction with a, a, a biologic methotrexate may reset the erosive process. So you could argue that actually there, there is some evidence that you might want to treat in certain patients with a biologic early. If you look at what we do with disease, we, we aim to get them into remission, but we now know that, that there is, and this is these are data based purely on statistical analysis, that if there is a window of opportunity, the response rate will not be linear, but will have a J-shaped curve with better responses early. And if we look at databases, and this was a, 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 an analysis done at ULAR this year, what you see is a very striking curve that is not linear. So it's suggesting there is a true window of opportunity. And a lot of us have been pursuing the uh, pathophysiological basis for that. And one is that we actually have subclinical disease and we also have immune dysregulation. And what you need to do is catch the patients extremely early. And there are a number of initiatives looking at this. One is to reduce subclinical disease. Uh, there's a number of studies. Uh, that we're, we're now looking at, which is, which is actually targeting the subclinical disease as the endpoint, treating to an ultrasound target rather than treating to a clinical target. And the other explanation we found is that there are immunological abnormalities, one of which is a, the, the age-corrective naive T-cell frequency, which if you have that and you give metotrexate, you have a very low chance of remission. But if your uh, immunology is essentially normal, metotrexate works brilliantly which is the explanation, we think, for some of the striking results that we've seen with very early methotrexate use in the preclinical era. And that's just saying that. And if you manage to give, have the opportunity to give TNF inhibition at that time, these are three separate studies, two double blind, one open, uh, prize is the first 12 months. There's absolute consistency. We're getting 70% intention to treat remission rates, and here, 40% remission in these very early patients after a single dose of TNF. It's much like, more like, I think, what we'd want to do, i.e. get rid of arthritis extremely quickly. These patients ha are completely reversible early on, and as I say, 70% very consistent with the same drug given uh, at the very early phase of disease when you are immunologically normal and have normal function. And just the final piece of information, our eight-year follow-up of our early patients, we still, after seven years of normal physician management, there was still a benefit for the remission induction approach. And you can see that there was also improvement in quality of life and hack. So this is one of our remission induction, 15 years. Our, he's seropositive, strongly ACPAR positive, rheumatoid factor. He's got no disease, he's on no therapy. He was actually one of our best responders, clearly. But in a small proportion of patients, you do reset disease, and in the majority, debulking early, I, I absolutely passionately believe, makes patients much, much easier to control later. Uh, and the ones that have been in our remission program are, are quite different patients 10, 15 years later. So I would suggest that guidelines are just that. They're not rules. Uh, some decisions are more financial than scientific, and I think there still are room for preferences, which I'm sure we'll have the chance to discuss. Um, these are the, some of the people who did the work on the ULAR task force for the guidelines. Thank you very much.